Well, you can't build it from here, well, I'm going to get started anyway. Because so, um, I've, I've got I've quite a few slides to get through. Um, but at any point, I, I lose you or there's some, some break in my logic that you don't see. Please stick your hand up and ask a question. Um, I, I, I won't mind, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to talk about some software that I wrote. Um, and before I, before I talk about the software, I, I should say thank you, um, because there have been three companies that have actually given me money to write this stuff, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, and, and all of these companies have this software deployed, so this is actually a production thing. Um, so what am I talking about? Um, I, I'm talking about the libraries I wrote. Um, I, it's about six or eight months old now, so it's not quite so new, um, but it's called message passing. Um, so, why? I, I mean, why did I write code in the first place? Because that <coughs> never works out well. Um, I, I'm not a particularly good programmer. I don't think of myself as a particularly good programmer. So, so why did I write some code? Um, so, I've actually written a generic library, um, and I've been about <coughs> 10 talks in a row about all the things you could do with this library. So I'm, I'm going to try and just concentrate in on one or two problems that it solves really, really well. Um, and it's applicable for a load of other things. Um, uh, what I've actually ended up at is much more generic than the few examples I'm going to show you. Um, but th this is only a 50-minute talk, so, so what I can cover is relatively limited. <laughs> Um, and so the problems that I'm going to talk about here are things that I've kind of been thinking about and working on for a couple of years. Um, and they illustrate the concerns and design choices that have led me to what I've done um, quite well. Um, and, well, everybody likes a story, right? Um, I've been working on this for a couple of years, so, so there, is, there is a story here. Um, so I guess we should start the way that most stories start. Once upon a time, I had a load of servers. Um, and trying to debug production applications that are running on 10 plus servers at once by tailing log files. Well, OK, you can do that. Production applications that run on 100 servers at once, I just don't have that many monitors on my desk. You know, you just can't tail 100 log files all at once and actually follow what's going on. Um, so, I need a solution to this problem, um, because I, I was debugging applications that were running on literally 100 servers at once. Um, and there's a commercial tool called Splunk, um, which I played with. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of it. Heard of it. And it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely the holy grail. Um, it was brilliant. Um, however, the licensing fees were going to run into the hundreds of millions of dollars range. Um, and that was completely unaffordable. So I <coughs> found this thing, I liked it, um, but well, there must be an open source alternative to this, right? Um, and the answer is right, of course, there is an open source alternative. Um, and it's a project called Logstash. Um, hands off anybody who's, who's heard of or looked at this in any way. Okay, that's, that's maybe 25% of you. Um, so that's good, because I'm going to stop and explain what the hell Logstash is and what it does. Um, so it's all about centralized logging. Um, that, that's, that's the problem I'm trying to solve. I want all of my logs in one place so that I can grep them in one place and look at them in one place, etc. Um, and so kind of the obvious traditional way to do this is syslog. Um, and so um, <coughs> syslog really isn't good enough for what I want to do. Um, it has a load of problems. Uh, I, I mean, it usually transports over UDP, which means that if your network goes away for 10 seconds, then all your debug information about why your network went away for 10 seconds has also just gone away, um, which is not so useful. Um, and you can transport syslog over TCP. Um, however, most syslog Ds I've played with, their reconnection policy and, and all that sort of thing is fairly dodgy. And if, if you're off, basically the behavior here was kind of undefined. Um, which is not cool. Um, and syslog has very limited fields. It has two or three fields and a text message, um, which kind of sucks because I didn't want to just log text lines. Um, 
Uh, again, there's no structure to the actual message, it's just some text, um, which is pretty unhelpful. Um, and, and I mean, my favorite one, uh, my favorite reason to not choose syslog is the syslog RFC, which says the observed behavior of a protocol. Uh, so, so, come on, uh, what is syslog? Nobody knows what syslog is, actually. Um, so, yeah, okay, Sys syslog, no, 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 I want something better. Um, and as I've kind of been saying, um, I, I would like to log structured information out of my applications. Like, say I have a web, web application, every time I process a request, I want to log the URL, and the request response status, and how long it took to generate the page, and you know, some other information that I can then use later to actually do useful analysis. Um, so we want to log data from our applications. I mean, we have code and applications, and you have data and timings and interesting stuff. And I don't want to squash that down into a sprint out string because because that's kind of horrible. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's 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 concentrate on web requests because that's a nice, easy example that everyone can think of. Um, so there we go. Here's here's some structured information that I would could capture for every single web request um, and then do useful metrics out of. Um, so for example, what requests or what URIs do the most database queries? Because they're probably the things that I should be looking at to optimize. What requests take the most time? What's the you know, mean and median and 95th percentile? What's the standard deviation? I, I want to be able to produce all of this sort of number. Um, so, um, okay. Um, we have a problem there. I'm going to have loads of logs that aren't coming out of my application that I control. Um, so say your Apache logs or your mail server logs or etc. Then there, you can't really change those. But, but that's okay. I mean, I have regular expressions. So, so I can use regular expressions <coughs> to parse these log messages that are just text lines back into something that's structured. Um, and, and then I have the same sort of useful formats. Um, Cool. Okay. So this kind of has a problem. At this point, I'm going to take a five-minute tangent to have a little rant. Um, because I, I think most of you are developers, or at least you, you develop some software some of the time. And I'd like to ask a big favor of you. Um, and this big favor is please do not ever invent a date format. Please don't, because there are so many already. There are so many. Um, so, just, just to kind of hammer this home, I, I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, so, here's Apache. Um, and, and, well, this is not all that bad, really. Um, it's kind of hard to parse and nasty. Um, and, of course, you'd never do more than one red request a second, therefore you don't need microsecond resolution. Um, <laughs> Sam Panda, Sam Panda. <laughs> But, okay, just, just a second. Right, Elasticsearch. Um, well, what's the comma? <laughs> what time zone am I in? Um, okay, that <laughs> starts to get me a little cross. Um, so, and I introduced this list, by the way, just by going through a few of the network services that I actually have running in production. And I just picked them up random, and every single one has different date formats. Rabbit MQ. Um, well, again, no time zone, no subsecond resolution. Um, you have to parse the text months and have a lookup table. You, you can't sort these in any sensible way um, because that ain't gonna work. Uh, it gets better. Seriously, <laughs> oh. <laughs> guys. Where's the year? Quite. And again, you don't do more than one database query per second, so you wouldn't possibly need the resolution. Awesome. <laughs> Syslog, well, even better. No year, no subsequent resolution, no, no um, time zone, um, no year. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's okay. All, all these things are really okay compared to, say, .NET. <laughs> <laughs> Which <laughs> this would be <laughs> this would be so bad, except for the bit in brackets. <laughs> and sometimes it's the first of January, and sometimes it's the third of January. And 
<laughs> Price bets now, which? <laughs> All right, and, and, and yeah, so, so. What even is that? <laughs> day, month, year, year, month, day? Phase of the moon? What? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Anyway, rant over. Um, I just have to say, just, just please don't do this because it will make me cross. Um, Logging to some sort of standard format. Um, there are a few. These are the ones I would recommend. Um, but even if you log in one of the insane formats I just showed you, that's fine because it's the same as someone else. Just don't invent something new. <laughs> anyway, so saving back to, to my actual talk. Um, we want centralized logging. Um, and so actually we're going to publish logs as JSON to a message queue. And, and that might sound kind of crazy, actually, or, or in fact, I'm sure it does sound kind of crazy the first time you hear it. Um, but JSON's really, really fast. Actually, really fast. Um, there's a JSON <coughs> parser and a JSON emitter in every single language going. It's simple enough that you can emit JSON from shell scripts if you want to. Um, and it is great for object structured data. Um, and it's readable. It's human readable. If you really need to get down and debug it, you can read the JSON yourself. <coughs> um, okay, so hopefully that's convinced you that JSON is not a completely insane choice. How about a message queue? Where, where the hell did that come from? Um, and this came from the fact that I'm logging a lot of messages. Um, and Unfortunately, well, no, fortunately, actually, I, I, I don't want to have to buy hardware that can keep up with my maximum message rate. Because the maximum message rate is actually much, 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 much faster than um, the average message rate. Um, as in, a thousand times faster. So if I have to keep up with a maximum message rate, I have to have hardware that's a thousand times faster than the actual average case. And that's, that's silly. That's, that's insane. So, I, I mean, I don't mind if I don't process a log message for a second or two. So if there's a burst, well, I, I just queue them up in some way. Um, and there are also some really nice other properties. Uh, I mean, this is why I need a message queue. Um, uh, but having one also gives you some really other nice properties. Um, it's easy to scale. Um, wonderfully, wonderfully easy to scale. You can just basically turn on more consumers, automatic scaling. Um, it lets you use smart routing, so you can have things that only subscribe to some messages, which is really, really useful. Uh, so, so you can have your normal log messages going wherever, but critical messages getting pushed into IRC, for example. Um, and they're pretty good as a common integration point, because almost every message queue worth its salt has got a client in almost every programming language worth its salt. And if you're just squirting JSON into a message queue, it mostly means that you can pull that JSON out again in pretty much any programming language you like, um, which is pretty handy, because um, I'm, I'm using about 10 or 12 programming languages that work, so, so this property is kind of nice. Um, so okay, I, I've, I've hopefully convinced everybody that the idea of putting a message queue in the middle isn't an insane idea, and it's not just complexity for complexity's sake. Um, so, what am I actually going to do with these messages when I've got them? Um, and, and I mean, the simple obvious answer would be I could just write them out to a file. And, and that would be much better than what I started with, because I would have one file to tail, not 100 files to tail. Um, and I could grab that file, and that would be cool and nice, and etc. Um, but if I've got all of this structured data, grep is probably not the best tool here. Um, so actually, um, I, I put all this data into Elasticsearch. Um, and Elasticsearch is a completely general purpose search engine. Um, it will do free text search, uh, and it will also do kind of big data queries on numeric data. Um, <coughs> and basically, you just throw <coughs> JSON documents into it. Um, you just pull your JSON documents into it, and it's really smart. It goes and it figures, it sees a few of JSON, your JSON documents. And it figures out what fields you're giving it and what kind of types they are, you know, if they're integers or strings or etc. Um, and it just does the right thing with that, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and you get replication and sharding and all the kind of nice enterprise features to make it reliable and you not lose data and be able to be scalable. They pretty much just come for free. Um, 
And, and as I said, it, it doesn't just do free text search, you can also get histograms of numeric data, so you can get all of your means and mediums and standard deviations and all of that sort of thing out for data that you put in that you didn't know you needed a running mean when you did it. So, so you, you can basically invent the queries you want to do on your data afterwards without having to know it in advance. So this is, this is pretty cool. Um, so I thought, cool, right, I'll take this log stash thing and stick a message to you in between and put data in Elasticsearch and life will be wonderful. Um, and yeah, it's pretty cool, it's flexible, it's extensible, um, you can plug new inputs and outputs into it. Um, there's a really awesome web interface for kind of searching your logs. Um, this is, really doesn't come up very well, um, but, but you, could, you can search for arbitrary data in here, or, or if you want to look within a specific structured message, you can look for data within a specific field, um, and you get graphs out and you can do analysis on fields, and, and etc. Um, so, cool, right, I'm going to try this. And so, how does this actually look when you deploy it? Well, I think about the simple case where I'm just going to use it to read my Apache logs. Um, I run Logstash on both of my web servers, uh, well, the two in this picture, um, and it reads the Apache logs and it does stuff with them and it pushes the data into AMQP. And then I run another instance of Logstash and that pulls data out of AMQP and sticks into Elasticsearch. Um, and so I played with this uh, and it's all cool, it works really, really nicely. Um, Cool, so I might want to start running this on all of my servers. Except there's a slight problem here. When I say all of my servers, I have loads of VMs of only a gig of RAM. Um, so that would be a problem right there, right? <laughs> you know, 50% of the memory of my server has gone to shipping logs. Well, that's not going to work so cool. Um, so that's totally out. Um, totally, totally out. Couldn't do that. This, this wasn't going to fly. And, and there we go. And I was sad. Um, so running log slash every host was out. Um, but actually, well, I do have these couple of big fat Elastic Search servers. So running it there would be okay. That's fine because they already have like 48 gigs of RAM each. So, so not a problem. Um, and the guy who wrote Logstash has written all the regular expressions for date parsing, so I don't have to. And, and we probably already covered that I hate writing regular expressions and I'm really bad at it. So if I can avoid doing that and reuse stuff that somebody who's much smarter than me has already written, then that would be a win, because the chances of me getting it wrong are very, very hard. Okay, so, so, well, I kind of thought next, well, why do I even bother? Um, having logs that on the end servers, why did I not just push stuff straight to AMQP from my application? Um, yeah, why, why don't I do that? Uh, and so I did do that, and I, I tried that. And it worked really well for about a week, and I was really happy. Um, and about a week later, for some reason, my RabbitMQ server got a little sick, and so started being a little slow. Um, and this meant that all of my websites went down, because they were logging stuff to AMQP, and it got slow, and so they couldn't log stuff, and, and suddenly the fact that I can't log stuff means that all my sites are there. And doom, 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 doom. Now, I mean, this is not, not a good thing. I, I, even if you're going to throw away all the log data, I would prefer to throw away all the data and have my site still be working. Because, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I need to rethink here. I, I, I really, really need to rethink. Um, I can't run log slash on the hosts. I can't just push the message queue from my application. That won't work. Um, 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 and so I found zero MQ at this point. Um, and zero MQ is uh, a networking library. It's not actually a message queue. It doesn't provide all the things that a message queue provides. It's just a networking library. Um, but it gives you a load of really, really nice things. Um, so it has publish, publish subscribe sockets. So you can do um, one producer producing messages for multiple consumers, which is cool. Um, it's never ever blocking. And I'm, I had a real problem with blocking at this point. Um, so I thought, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, if it needs to be, you, well, you can optionally configure it to be lossy. 
And I wanted it to be lossy, or, or no. Normally, I want to keep all my messages thank you, but I'd rather keep my websites running than keep my messages. You know, if, I, if I have to make that compromise, then, then that would be the right way to go. Um, and Zero MQ will do buffering for you. And it will do buffering to disk, and you can configure how much to buffer, and where to buffer it, and etc. Um, it lets you have arbitrarily sized messages, which fixes the fact that syslog doesn't, for example. Um, and all the I.O. is done in the background thread. Um, and, and if you're writing code in Perl, or Ruby, or something that, that doesn't do threads all that well. Whoops, I just lost the slice. Something that doesn't do threads all that well, shall we say. Then this is a nice thing, because, hmm, I've lost the slice. change any of your code in your application. You don't have to write your application in a specific way. You, you can just add this after the fact, um, which is awesome. Um, so, cool. Um, I found ZeroMQ and had a play around with it. And, um, it actually fulfills all of my needs. So, my next plan and idea was, what I'll do is I'll have a little program that runs on each host. that um, collects <coughs> logs from the application. And it also listens for syslog, so I can collect anything sent by a syslog. And it can also tail log files if I needed to, and uh, pull that in. Um, and and it will get all of this stuff and then ship up to the MPP server we were talking about before. Um, so this looks kind of like this. Um, so here we go, we've got our zero MQ Perl code, um, our log collector, and our MQP, uh, and then the Elasticsearch stuff is kind of the same. Um, and I've called this indexer rather than log stash because I also wrote this part as well, just because while I was there. Um, so I, I had this script, and I had this script, and this was talking two or three network protocols, and this was talking a couple of network protocols, and you can kind of see where I'm starting to go, because I have two different scripts, and I kind of wanted them to share some code. Um, so, this talk is about my new library. Uh, the, what it does, the clue is kind of in the name. Um, I think it's really simple. Um, I also think it's probably useful. Um, and it is really small. So you can have a play with it and use it and then throw it away and replace it with your own stuff. Uh, I piecewise <coughs> on totally uh, and it's too big an investment. Um, so, okay, I've kind of got to how I got here. I kind of wanted a log shipper. Uh, and I accidentally a framework for, for <coughs> uh, interoperating between many, many, many message queues. Uh, whoops. But I did end up with, at one point, about a dozen different scripts that were talking to one or more message queues. And I, I, I re-implemented that stuff, or a chunk of that stuff, a dozen times. And I got really sick of it. Um, so so I, I just factored out the common bits. Um, this is where we are. Um, so does this actually work? Well, yes. It certainly works for me. I've deployed it in production at four sites. Um, some of the adapters for some of the queues that I'm not actually using in anger are kind of partially complete. I mean, they're, they're there and they work, um, but I haven't run them in production, therefore I'm not prepared to say that they would run in production. Um, and it's much done with log stash. It's really simple. It's single threaded, um, it, it'll only use one of your cores. But that's fine, because zero MQ is insanely fast. And all I'm really doing is kind of throwing messages around, which isn't a lot of work. Um, I, I mean, one of these processes can quite happily do 50 million messages a day on um, a VM of a gig of RAM without significantly impacting the CPU. So, so it's fine. Um, and other crazy people are actually using this in production. Um, Damien, who isn't in the room at the moment, good. Oh, I didn't take his name in vain. Um, 
Damien sent me this on IRC um, and, and then contributed a couple of adapters before I even put this thing on CPAP. Um, so obviously, he says, well, like he says, I only wrote a couple of hundred lines of code and I have all of this stuff. Excellent, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so, okay, that's kind of the end of the story. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about kind of how this works um, and, and then show a few examples of, of kind of using it. Um, so, um, I thought about this and thought about this um, and um, we need a simple abstraction for this. So let's have an event and that event can be a hash. Okay, that is. Um, and you, know, you can stuff your structured data in there, you can convert it to and from JSON, all good. Um, and let's call, have something called an output. And an output consumes events. The only thing about an output is to have a method called consume that takes one parameter that is an event. That's it. Um, and let's have inputs. An input is something that has an attribute called output2. And that's it. And a filter is something that has both of these things. Um, so basically, the entire crux of the code here is dollar self arrow output to arrow consume message, and that's that's all you need. Uh, and from that, you can build a whole chain of inputs and outputs and filters, and it all works. Uh, really, that's it. That that's all the complexity. It's really, really, really dead simple. Um, I lie a bit because depending upon what your inputs and outputs are, then there's kind of going to be usernames and passwords or certificates or all sorts of things to do with the specific inputs and outputs that you choose. Um, but I can't really control that. Um, I can't help with that. Um, at the, the core of it, though, is as simple as it can be. Um, and things like hostname, every adapter, if it needs a hostname, the attribute is called hostname, which means that the API for all of these inputs and outputs is fairly similar, and so that gets me away from the annoying, I'm using three different message queues, all of which have completely different parameters and their Perl modules work in completely different ways. This, this just kind of unifies over the top of that. Um, so, okay, what can you actually do with this? Um, and the answer is you can talk to quite a few things. Um, there's, there are modules on CPAN for every single one of these. Um, perhaps 0MQ, MQP, Stomp, Redis, Elasticsearch, Syslog, MongoDB, Collect D for shipping metrics, um, you can do HTTP posts based off it, it'll do UDP, etc. Um, I haven't written an IRC input or output plugin yet, because no. But you could obviously easily do that. I am waiting for someone to do that. Um, okay, and so I showed you kind of the simplest one chain of one input and some filters and output. Um, but you can build more complex chains. You can build Y-shaped chains or T-shaped chains or, or whatever you want to. Um, and the distribution supplies a little DSL um, that helps you, helps you build these <coughs> chains. Um, it also supplies you with um, a, a, CLI, a simple CLI program, which is like one input, one output, and one filter, um, which is for testing mostly. Um, but you can actually do some real things with it. Um, so, the CLI application looks like this, um, as it starts. So, <coughs> I've called them decode and encode, but it's basically just three filters. So, by default, you get, well, you get an input, a decoder, an encoder, an output, and a filter. <coughs> um, and the CLI has a few little features, um, like you can supply the config file, you can ask it to demonize, you can ask it to change user, you know, kind of all those little things that if you wanted to write a log ship without writing any code, well, you can totally use this. You just wrap this command line thing in a shell script to feed it the right options, and there you go. Um, cool. So, um, the core disk supplies DSL, the command line stuff, um, some roles that you can reuse if you're writing your own filters or, or your own things. Um, and then most of the network protocols are in their, their own separate CPAN modules, so you only have to take what you want. Um, and the core is move based, uh, and that means that it includes um, no excess code, so you can fat pack it. Um, and it also means that it's Moose compatible, so if you want to subclass it with Moose code, um, then you can. Uh, and in fact, I, I beat up MST's Moose upgrading stuff until this actually works. And I've touched the video yet, haven't I? Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think out to reinsert there. Uh, yeah, we're back. Excellent. Uh, okay. 
Okay. Where's my model? Okay. So, um, the demos. Is that what they want? Cool. Um, I'm not actually going to do any live demos for this. I mean, I can if anyone really wants me to, but the simple demos are pretty boring, so I'm just going to show you some slides. Um, so the simplest thing you could possibly do is this. You can tell it to input stuff from stood in and output stuff to stood out. Um, well, there you go. And, and in fact, it input stuff decodes it as JSON, does nothing to it, encodes it as JSON again, and then outputs it. <coughs> Completely useless. Um, less trivial example. Okay, well, let's actually throw things across the network with zero key. And there you go, you run those two tiny little scripts and you can type in one and you get the messages out in a moment. Dead easy. Looks like that. Um, and of course, with that, you can just run multiple consumers and you get the message in multiple places. Or you can change your zero and queue options slightly and you can have multiple consumers and they get messages around Robin between them. Uh, and which, whichever architecture you happen to want, it's, it's just a few command line option changes away. Um, so, there we go, that's a simple 0 queue example. Um, and as I've said, this, this framework lets you talk to lots of message queues. So, um, who's heard of this game? So, let's play message queue Jenga, right? <laughs> so, if you run these, one, two, three, four, and I can only fit four scripts on the slide, I'm afraid. Um, so this isn't <coughs> as silly as it could be. Um, but there you go, you, you can push a message through three <coughs> different message queues and have it come out the other end. Just like that. Um, those, those, those few scripts. Um, okay, well, that was definitely not silly enough. Um, so, when I was first writing this talk, <coughs> I was kind of thinking, uh, okay, I can I find a more silly example than that? Um, and it was kind of hard. So, so I had to go and look on the internet, and I thought, well, what's, what's a cool thing that's, that's using messaging quite interestingly? Um, and I thought, oh, I found this thing called Mongrel 2, um, which, which is a web server. Who's, who's heard of this in any way? Uh, some people, some people. Okay, so I thought that I would reinvent Mongrel 2 um, really badly, um, just mostly for shits and giggles. Um, so let's think about how we do this. PSGI is just a hash, right? PSDI request is just a hash. Um, I, I, can, I can do a little fiddling in it and then serialize it as JSON. Um, cool. Uh, a PSDI response is just an array, so obviously I can serialize that as JSON. No problem. Um, let's kind of ignore three responses and anything even vaguely complex for the moment, shall we? Um, but yeah, okay. Cool. So if you in the <coughs> message passing PSDI and you run X, um, no, seriously, this will run Catalyst applications and everything, dude. Um, you, you get this. You, you, you have a model to server and, and requests and responses, and you can run multiple handler processes, um, and stuff gets distributed between them, and you've got hot restarts from your application for free. You've got hot add and removable workers for free. Um, uh, please don't actually try running this in production. Um, but, but, but theoretically, I mean, this is this, this is like 150 lines of code, if that, 100 lines of code. Um, just as an example, for you can do something quite non-trivial around this framework if you want to. Um, so I've, I've, I've talked about logging, uh, a lot about logging, but it actually has loads of other applications. Um, I, I mean, the obvious one being queue jobs and a worker pool, um, with workers taking a job and doing some work and then pushing some results somewhere. Um, you can just get that sort of stuff for free. Um, other applications, um, I'm using it a load of places uh, to do kind of web streaming out to clients, or web sockets, or multi-part XXR, um, and HTTP push notifications, so web hooks, as in PayPal IPN or the Shopify API. Um, you basically just have a message like that, um, and you send a message like that, um, and then the data part gets wrapped up as JSON, and you get an HTTP post including that data. Um, and so <coughs> you can do this <coughs> on your web application. So when, when someone changes something, you can make a callback to someone else's API, um, and you do it in a completely non-blocking way, so that even if that API is down, <coughs> then your web application doesn't stop. Um, Okay, so that's that's pretty cool, uh, and, and 
Again, there's a web app that hooks it up to on CPAN. Um, I am using this in production. It's pretty cool um, for, for a real API. Okay, so going back to the plan, what, what, about, what about this log stash thing um, that I was talking about? Well, cool. We're going to use my lightweight code on the end nodes. Um, we're going to let log stash do the parsing and filtering again because I, I hate day four <coughs> and someone has already done that part. Um, and there's a bit of filtering involved to, to make what I'm sending over the network and what Logstash expects to be the, look the same. But I mean, that's like 10 lines of code. Cool. Um, and so, interoperating. Cool. So, what I'll do is I'll log JSON events as maps in multiple <coughs> languages. And when I say in multiple languages, I think that we currently have stuff deployed in Java and Clojure and Scala and Ruby and Python and Perl and PHP that's doing this. Um, so, so that's yeah, a few languages. Um, and we output stuff to zero MQ. Um, and I wrote a script in message passing called log collector because I'm really good with inventive names. Um, and what this does is it collects these zero MQ messages, does some processing on them. Um, and then sends them all on to a central log stash. Um, and then that log stash does some pretty nice, or some more processing munging. And it sends them on to a thing called StatsD, which does a load of aggregation. Um, and I then get those, that data aggregated, and that gets output to a thing called Graphite, that then draws me graphs. Um, cool. And it kind of looks like that. So, now all these different things going into log collector, Moving to the standard format and phone that over the network to Logstash, which is out of various different places. Um, and this means that I just have to kind of define a standard log message format, is an example. Um, and a standard event message format where I've actually got a structured event rather than just a text log. Um, and you see there's, there's all sorts of metadata about what machine it came from, what timestamp, etc. Um, and then you've got the actual structured data here. Um, and so we could make a standard event message called time web request. Um, so this is pretty much what I was talking about before. Same, exactly the same thing. Um, so I, I, I'm using these for every web request, and then Statsd. <coughs> this stuff all gets squirted into Statsd, um, and it takes, it, it has timers and counters, and it rolls them up every 10 seconds, and it makes a metric. Um, so what you do is, is you have a statistic name. So you say, I would like a statistic foo, uh, and please increment it by one. Um, statistic foo, please increment by one. Statistic foo, please increment by one. And then when 10 seconds has gone, it counts up all the things in the bucket foo. That was three, and it outputs foo three. Um, so you basically get a first derivative uh, of, of your message flow. Um, so, I can use counters um, for things like request rates, and <coughs> HTTP status rates, um, etc. Um, I can use timers um, for adding up page time, total times for generating pages, the mean page time, the maximum, minimum page times, all that sort of stuff. Um, and what does it actually look like? Well, this is my config in, log, in <coughs> my log slash configuration file uh, that basically says take events call time web request um, and stuff them out with application name, environment name, and response status name. And in Graphite, this ends up looking like this. My application is called Futures Role. Uh, my environment is production. And here are graphs of the rate of 200 or the rate of 500. Um, so obviously, I, I can then, given that, um, do alerting based on the fact that if the rate of 500 goes higher than a certain amount, then, then that's a problem. Um, or simply, I could do if a rate of 500, you know, 500 being a web error page, um, if the rate of those divided by the total rate <coughs> of requests goes over a certain level, then I'll work. Um, cool. And so I get out graphs kind of like that from there. Um, and the nice thing about this being, of course, that the only thing I have to do from any application in any language whatsoever. It's just in there, something that looks like this time web request event, and I just get all these graphs for free up at your end. So it means that whenever I write a new application, um, I just have to 
write out a few standard log messages, and there we go, I've got all the metrics and all the, 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 the graphs and performance numbers that I need for that in the application, having spent kind of literally no effort. You know, it's, it's, it's 10 minutes to get all the metrics for a new application in a new language, which is a massive bonus. Um, because my company is kind of rolling out a new application every three months at the moment, uh, and seemingly the new application is in whatever new JVM based language they feel like this three months. Um, so, being able to reuse this has been awesome. Um, okay, and that's it really. Um, the code is on CPAM, um, there's an RLC channel. If anyone really, really cares, um, then all the examples that I kind of gave you, there are some scripts in that Git, uh, GitHub gist um, that you can download, you can actually run my examples, um, rather than me boring you by running them for you. Um, and that's it, thanks. Any questions? Exim adapter. Sorry? Exim adapter. Um, That'll be file reader at the moment, or alternatively, you can get your XM to output to syslog directly and then read syslog. Okay. Um, yep. Have you considered any sort of, um, so you've mentioned lots of languages, um, have you considered a, a C library? Because that all of a sudden makes it possible to put it into, like, directly into all of your standard C system binaries. Um, yes, um, yes, I have. However, <coughs> um, the, the fight that I had to go through um, with uh, most of my applications at New were for Java. Mm. Um, and JVM people do not <coughs> have native dependencies. Mm. They really don't. Um, oh, no, so I mean, each language can have its own, but you know, there are still large amounts of system tools. You know, yeah. All the standard Unix demons and things that are in C. Uh, absolutely. Mm. And, and yes, I, I, I could do something like that. I, I guess I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> is, is the answer. Um, I, I mean, the, the pull works well enough and is small enough. But, but, you know, it's about 20 meg or so, um, uh, kind of working for me. And that's, that's fine in a gig machine. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't need it to be fast enough, um, fast enough or low enough memory to, to want to see, basically. Any more questions? All right, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody.